I worked for, uh, <clears throat> not to say how old I am, but, but I was thinking back, I've been working at a job for almost 50 years. And uh, as many of you are about to head back to school, many of you are teachers, um, you know, I'm an engineer, uh, design computer chips, have all these deadlines coming up. I, I struggle with work sometimes. It's, it's a constant thing. You know, it, it's many hours a day. Uh, if you're a, a mom, <laughs> your job is 24-7. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, uh, something that we need to, to, to uh, work with. And, um, but there's three things I want to show today. And let me see if I can turn this a little bit. The... Um, this is a view of the uh, world's 10 tallest buildings. And uh, one thing that's curious about buildings, the green part, can everybody see that okay? The green part is the part that is not inhabitable. <laughs> and you would think, why would you go to the cost and expense of building something uninhabitable on top of your building? And that's because you could get the bragging rights for the world's tallest building. Uh, every 10 years or so, one building... Um, uh, fights the others for, for the bragging rights. Uh, I love how they call it vanity heights because I think that picks up both shades of the term vanity. One would mean, you know, an obsessive uh, pride and, and conceit, and the other would mean absolutely good for nothing. <laughs> and that has both of those. These are people that have, that go back even from Genesis 6. We have this, this idea of, of mankind coming together and rejecting God and saying, we're going to honor our technology, and we're going to work hard as a group, as a society, to, to gr uh, get a name for ourselves, I believe is the phrase it uses. In other words, our identity, this is going to show who we are, and our technology and our work will be hard, but it's going to be focused on exalting ourselves. Uh, so this is these are people that work hard, um, but for the wrong reason. Uh, the next group, these are people, first people were working hard. These people are hardly working. <laughs> this is the group that we call the quiet quitters. And this is a recent Gallup poll that's estimated in the U.S. Two out of three people have said that they are quiet quitting. This, this, this is barely getting by, doing the bare minimum amount of work. Uh, these are the people that, you know, you would call at work, the nickname might be Levi's because they leave at 501, right? So it's, it's the idea of just doing the bare minimum that is uh, possible. So these people are hardly working, but they haven't quite quit. They're still doing some work. The third group are the people that have actually quit, and that is the, the retirement folks. You know, the view of retirement is, you know, I want to get rid of, I want to stop working. I do not want to work, and that I want my life to be a perpetual vacation, a, a perpetual Caribbean cruise where I sit on the beach, hold hands with my loved ones, and watch the sun set on my life, right? And, and, and that's, an ex, that's an extraction, uh, extrapolation, obviously, from uh, uh, what some things, but there's the temptation to think that, right? Uh, I know those pictures. The, the pictures like this, they grab our attention. They focus, as a matter of fact, I saw one that it, I was just looking at it and thought, oh, that is such a beautiful place. I'd love to be there. I'd love to not have to work, you know, go to work on Monday, and I would love to be there. And I read the caption that said, this is retirement. If you want to do it, get back to work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was, it was effective. So these, were, these are all the wrong perspectives uh, of what work is. They're distorted. Um, they don't really, uh, they've deviated from the biblical view of work. We think of work as, as a punishment, as part of sin, you know, that, that came after the fall. But that's not true. Uh, what we need to do is to uh, gain a biblical view of work and understand God's call to work. Uh, so we'll look at that today. Um, it's out of Genesis. It's not real clear here. Genesis, we'll be skipping around the first, couple of, of, uh, first three chapters of Genesis and then in Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. Uh, so we'll go through two passages and we'll cover each of those uh, and I'll point, you, point out where we are. Let's look at the uh, first one. No, I'm sorry, before we do that, let me point out this book by Timothy Keller. This has been a great blessing uh, during this study. Uh, it's a great resource for uh, good biblical theology on, on work. Um, uh, I've been blessed by it, and I would highly recommend it. Uh, every good endeavor. Uh, so it's a, a, a been a blessing to me. So in looking at that, let's look at a couple of areas today. One would be the origin work. Where did work come from? And then second, our offering of work. Uh, how should we uh, be doing our work? If, I, if work is such a problem nowadays, how can we redeem it? How can it be made uh, the offering to God as it's supposed to be? 
Um, and let me pray here as we begin. Father, we want to um, honor you in our work, to do everything for your glory. Um, uh, Father, to be zealous for good works as you've designed us to be. Show us from your word, Lord, how that you would apl- help us to apply this today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, going back to the beginning, it's a great place to start, I've heard. Uh, the, um, in verse 26 of chapter 1, it says this. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Um, And God saw, we'll come back to these, look at these verses here, uh, these phrases. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That'll be one we'll look at. Next one will be, what does it mean to subdue it? Subdue the earth. What does it mean to have dominion over the earth? Uh, We'll come back to that in in a moment. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. At the end, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. And then as we skip into chapter 2, I just picked out a couple of verses here that I thought were interesting. It's talking about what God's, it's kind of a recap of creation. It said God planted, the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So one of the first views we have of God is a gardener, right? You think that's, that's an interesting perspective. Um, but notice, after he planted the garden, he didn't continue to maintain it and tend it. He, the Lord God, took the man and put him in the garden to work it and keep it. So again, God did the work, but then man followed up and, and imitated what God did. And I think that's the key uh, thing to take away from here. When we look back at the beginning, the thing that should surprise us is that God is working, right? God is, work is what God does from the beginning. This should be the the biggest surprise to, to, I think, most of world cultures. Because if you look at the Romans or the the Greeks uh, or Babylonian mythologies, work was not something that God did. Uh, The gods were on perpetual vacation, and work was a curse that uh, they placed on mankind. Work was for the lesser beings. Uh, the idea was, for the Greeks anyway, that, that you know, your mind and the spirit is good. The body is evil. And so the more physical work you do, the more that makes you lower, more like the animals. And, and so really, the, what you, the ideal thing to do is to be... Um, I'm trying to think here, uh, to be unemployed. (laughs) And that idea was that you don't have to work. You can just go around thinking all day, uh, writing songs and and doing poetry because that's mental work. That's not as degrading as physical work. Aristotle even famously said one time, he said, you know, actually just some people are born to be slaves. Uh, And what he meant was that some people are not as capable of higher rational thought and therefore should do the work that frees the more talented and brilliant to pursue a life of honor and culture. Uh, and so again, this is, the, this is where most people come from. And, and even though we could look down on that today, that still creeps into our thoughts, right? We want white-collar jobs. We don't really want a blue-collar job because, you know, it's just, it's just hard work and work is so demeaning. And that's a corruption of what Scripture said. That's an influence of the Greek thought uh, to our culture. And that's not like God. When we look at... Um, what God's work is like. We see, that, well, we see that God works. And what is his work like? Well, at creation, we see that he's very creative. He brings things out of nothing. But he also forms and fashions things. Uh, he gives them uh, potential. We see him creating different um, uh, 
uh, environments, the heavens, the seas, the earth, and then he populates those, uh, stars, uh, the teeming uh, sea life, uh, the land creatures, and mankind. He, he cares for uh, his garden. He blesses through his work. He creates through his work. He develops through his work. He um, uh, works and, and creates, uh, brings out the potential of the raw material there. And so that's the kind of work that God does. And so, yeah, it should su- surprise us um, that, um, that God comes as a gardener. And, and, and so this is the key point, I think, from this, this passage, is that all work, all good work is, is good. All kind of, you know, and, and not sinful work, but, but there is work that is good because God is one that, that works. God is the one, all work carries dignity, all good work carries dignity because it reflects who God is. It's part of his nature. It's something that he does. Um, but in this, before we leave this section, notice at the end, work is also balanced with rest. Work is not all there is. There is also a place for rest. Now, when I would, if I were designing the proportions for rest, I might decide, you know, six days of rest and one day of work. But that's not what God did. <laughs> God did the other way around. Uh, and it's interesting, um, I think I have it uh, uh, at some point, I don't know if I'll cover it, but basically to summarize, there was an American psychological study that viewed, um, that tested people how much they worked. And they found out that people that, uh, that worked uh, too many hours per day had a poor quality of life. It's like, oh, yeah, I can identify with that. But they also said people that worked too few hours a day viewed themselves as having poor quality of life because they didn't feel productive. And so there was always a balance of having the right amount of work. Uh, too much work is bad, too little work is bad. There's a, there's a balance. Work is not all there is. Uh, rest is, is needed. And because work is uh, what God uh, does, and he created man in his image, we see that he assigns work to mankind. And notice this is before the fall. So work is a good thing. It's designed to be a good thing. It's something that, that we're designed to do. We're designed to work. And just like that study showed that, that yeah, if we aren't working, uh, if you go into, a uh, let's say, a nursing home or an assisted living home where folks are unable to work, there's a dissatisfaction because they don't feel productive, right? Too much uh, unemployment, quote unquote, is, is bad. Um, uh, even in, I think uh, Alan mentioned, even in caring for the poor, uh, you know, in the scriptures, the care for the poor, there was a, a, an idea of gleaning. It was the idea of uh, not gleaning all of your fields or not gathering everything in the field, leaving a little bit for the poor. And it wasn't that you just gave to the poor directly, it's that they had to go and gather and work for it a little bit. And that added some dignity to the care that they had. And, and that's something I think that's, that's a little different than what we do nowadays, and I, I think we could learn from that. But um, work was assigned to, to, to mankind, and it expresses our design because we're created in the image of God. Now, we talked about those phrases, subdue. What does that mean? Subdue sounds kind of ominous, but it, what it means, it, uh, it means to shape and, um, and order to bring the potential out of raw material. It doesn't mean to exploit uh, God's view of what we should be doing is not, um, it's not uh, like a, a uh, greedy company strip mining a mountain. <laughs> but it's also not like a park ranger in a national park that just maintains everything the way they, it is. It's, it's bringing the raw material and bringing, uh, informing it and shaping it to f- bring out its, its raw potential. What does it mean to have dominion? Uh, it involves, uh, it, it implies some authority over the earth. It implies... Um, the earth and its creatures. Also, it also implies responsibility, uh, stewardship, and accountability, right? If, if God assigned us uh, dominion, that means that we're responsible to him for what he assigned, that we have a stewardship. There's a, a responsibility. We talk nowadays about sustainable uh, type of activities on the earth. That's, that's a biblical idea. We're, we are to give an account for how we manage the earth, uh, both globally and locally, how we, how we do that. It's uh, it's, um, 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 anyway, it's, it's one of those things that, that um, uh, carries that responsibility, stewardship, and accountability. The um, um, third thing I, w- I wanted to note out here is that God speaks today in our calling, in our vocation. 
uh, whenever you talk about a calling, uh, that means that somebody's talking to you, right? That you're doing something in response and for someone else. That's what calling means. When you talk about a vocation, vocation sounds like the word vocal. Again, it's that same idea that we're listening to somebody calling us. And this is the origin of that, that concept, that God calls every person to work because God called mankind to work. He calls each of us to work. And he speaks to us today in our calling and vocation to fulfill his mandate and to bless others through the myriads of gifts that he gives us. He gives us all different gifts, and he calls us to do those to bless others, to be creative, to work as God works, to be creative, to, to, to bring the full potential out of raw material, to bless others. Um, it's like when you think of the chain of command um, or the organization structure, you know, you think, well, okay, I work for TI, and so, you know, my, my boss is Ryan, his boss is Krish, and his boss is Vinkatesh, and then we go back through India a few places, and then we come back to the U.S. Uh, and uh, go to a guy named Haviv that Tom and I have, have worked with for many years. Um, he's the CEO of Texas Instruments, the company for whom I work. But that's not where the chain of command ends, because that directly goes to God. Because God is the author of the command to work. And so we all have an organization chart that at the very top, all mankind does, that begins with God at the top. Uh, that's an important concept. And so to understand that whatever work we do, we need to understand it's our, uh, it to be a calling in response to the, what the Lord directs us to do and how he's equipped us and gifted us. Uh, our, it's our vocation, our calling, our response to him. And so what we find in when we do this is that we not only work for God, but God works through us in every good work. Now, this is, this is a concept. I don't know. I'd really thought about that way. Um, it's this idea of fill the earth, uh, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And you think, well, maybe that just means to have more kids, right, and, and increase the population. But it, for humans, because we're relational beings, it means more than that. It means building a human culture. And in building a human culture like the way we're designed to do, that brings a blessing to everybody. Now, let me illustrate that. Uh, you could say, Tim, you know, the forecast for today is 108. Why are you wearing long sleeves? <laughs> and it would be because I know I'm in an air-conditioned building, right? How many are blessed by air conditioning, right? Uh, Jacob and, um, and um, Jose, I think, worked this summer on air conditioning, bringing air conditioning people. Does that bless people? Absolutely. You know, is that a God directed blessing absolutely those kids how many people know how air conditioning works i on the way up here did you okay quit raising your hand tom but <laughs> on your way on your way up here um think about all the ways that we depend on human culture to bless us um did you how far did you walk to get here today oh you drove how long did it take you to design your vehicle how often how long did it take you to mine the metals to make your vehicle what is your recipe for 87 octane to, to drive your vehicle? You know, all of these things that we take for granted, it's like, any of that. How many know how to play an instrument? I know a, a few of us. How many know it well enough to lead people in worship? How many know how to run the soundboard back here? All of these skills, all of these gifts, um, many of you have them. And as you exercise them, you bring blessing. You glorify God because of his calling to you, his gifting of you. That's something that's really amazing. Martin, um, Martin Luther said it this way. He says, you know, when we pray for daily bread, um, we need to expand our understanding. We need, we're not only praying for daily bread, we're praying for everything that contributes to our having and enjoying daily bread. Um, it doesn't go as far as just the flour bin and the baking, but also over to the broad fields the farmlands, the entire country that produces, processes, and conveys to us our daily bread and all kinds of nourishment. God could give you grain and fruit without your plowing and planting, but he does not want to do so. He wants to do it through people, through people. Um, how does God feed every living thing? Um, Tim Keller would say from uh, Psalm 145, isn't it through the farmer the baker, the retailer, the website programmer, the truck driver, the oil field worker, and all who contribute to bring us food. This is part of God's design. We are relational creatures. We um, work together. What's amazing also, though, is that God bestows his gifts. It's not just to Christians that he does this. 
This is a part of being uh, human. This is part of being created in God's image. He gives and bestows us with common grace. You remember the passage in Matthew 5 where he says, God, we're to be like our, um, or to love our enemies and be like our heavenly father who gives rain to both the just and the unjust. You know, someday, Lord willing, when it does rain here, uh, when you see it raining, we won't say, oh, there's a Christian over there it's raining on. <laughs> I know God's blessing them. It's not raining on the unbeliever over there, that wicked guy. Uh, God shows the, his common grace to us all, and we all should give thanks that he gives us common grace uh, for those uh, uh, scientists that are believers, for those scientists that are not believers, for those uh, doctors that are believers. I, the way I think of this is um, back in 1981 in March, I don't know if you remember, uh, how many of you remember uh, when Ronald Reagan, President Ronald Reagan was shot by an assassination attempt? He was rushed to the doctors and um, uh, President Reagan was never for lack of a one, good one-liner. So he's being rolled into the surgery and the doctors are there and, he, and he's laying there and he goes, I hope you guys are all Republicans. <laughs> but the truth is, uh, everybody laughed. He said, but the truth is, he didn't really want Republicans to be his doctors. He didn't really care if they were Democrats or Christians even. What he wanted were competent doctors. They were skillful doctors. Those who had been gifted with that skill from God to do their work with excellence. And that's what we do. When we do our work with excellence, it blesses others. It brings a, a great um, a cultural blessing to everyone. Author Dorothy Sayers said it this way. She said, you know, the, search, the church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him, don't be drunk and disorderly during his leisure hours, uh, and then come to church on Sundays. But what the church should be telling him is this, that the very first demand that his religion makes upon him is that he should make good tables. <laughs> and so the very first thing that we should see when we are, uh, have the Spirit of God within us showing us the truth of God's Word is that God has gifted you with very special gifts that are unique and that as you exercise them, uh, you bring a blessing not to just yourself but to others to bring a cultural blessing. Um, our work shouldn't ref uh, should reflect God's gifts and calling to our lives. Uh, and these aren't going to be the same for, for everyone. God gives dignity. God's calling gives dignity to everybody. Whether you work in quote-unquote secular work or whether you work quote-unquote in, sa uh, in sacred work. Whether you work in ministry or whether you work in, in menial tasks or whether you work in mental tasks. Um, we must not compare, exalt, or despise one another's calling. Uh, I don't have time to really go into it a lot today, but in 1 Corinthians 7, 17, it's interesting. Paul uses the word calling both to refer to God's calling us to be believers and also our calling to our vocations, to our work. Uh, it's the same call because the organization chart goes to the same person. It's, it's God who brings both, who calls us both to salvation. That's a restoring of the way that things he created. Uh, and call to work, which is the way that he designed things to be created. You know, when I think of, um, when I think of this idea, I think we're starting football here. So I think of seventh grade football. That was the first time I actually played football on a team, other than just pick-me-up games and things, right? And so I remember our coach, I thought it was pretty funny. He, he asked us, he said, why don't you uh, line up in the position that you want to go out for? And of course, being, you know, uh, football savvy uh, seventh graders, we all lined up in either a the line for quarterback, the line for wide receiver, or the line for running back. Um, because that's what we see on TV. Those are the big star positions on TV. And that's what we thought, well, that's what we are. Everybody should be going for that. And the coach got me and goes, okay, you're a tackle, you're a guard. You're <laughs> you just started going down the line. And, and uh, uh, because no team works with only those positions in the star players. Um, you wouldn't win many games if you only had offense and you had no defense. Um, God works the same way. He calls us to, to many different jobs. And we do a disservice when we look down on someone else for their work because all work is dignified, because all work is what God does. Um, and so we think, okay, well, this is, this is how society was designed to work. What happened? Well, as relational beings, 
what happened is we broke the relationship <laughs> by our sin. As Eve was tempted uh, by the serpent, she believed that God didn't have their best interest in mind and that she was going to fe- have the fear of missing out. And by keeping them from that fruit, what God was doing was uh, keeping them from being decis- from making those kind of decisions. And, and so the serpent lie was actually a half-truth. He says, you know, in the day that you eat of it, you'll be like God. And that appealed to her. But what she didn't realize, that when you, we weren't designed to be God. Like a, uh, you know, you have a motorboat that's designed to operate inside water and work well. Well, if you take it out of water, it'll burn up. It's not designed to work outside that particular environment. We're not designed to be our own God, to call our own shots, to do our own thing. And look what happened here. This is the, this is the section in 316 where uh, God is giving um, uh, Eve and Adam the consequences of what they did. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring, bring forth children. This, this um, be fruitful and multiplying became painful. Uh, it's no uh, coincidence that it's called a labor <laughs> in delivery room, right? Is that it's work. It's painful work to bring forth a child. Um, And then notice this. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Now, I know we talk about this a lot of times in husband-wife relationships, how that, you know, God has established the husband as the head of the home and and, uh, the wife is to submit to his leadership and everything and how that's a challenge. But I think this goes to all mankind in the sense of we all have trouble working for somebody else, right? We all want to be the one in charge. We want to work for ourselves. We want to be the boss. We don't like to do what other people tell us to do. Uh, when we are in charge, we have the tendency that says he shall rule over you. That idea has the idea of being harsh in leadership. And we have a tendency of, of wanting to dominate others and to control them uh, when we're in charge. So this, this organizational and authoritative relationship is, was broken through the fall. Notice what he says to Adam. And to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. Uh, By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Uh, What happened in the fall? The fall brought a curse to work. Uh, There's a curse involved. Uh, We mentioned that that it broke the authority structure. Basically, we displaced God. We became God. We took his his spot, and the results are disastrous. Um, Rejecting God opened the door for work, our work, to become an idol, right? To take worship, you know, you say nature abhors a vacuum, leadership abhors a vacuum, worship abhors a vacuum. Whenever we take God out of the place of our worship, many other things pop into place, and work, for many of us, has become that idol that we worship. Um, That broken relationship with God fractured our other human relationships, introducing mistrust, um, domineering, insubordination, and selfishness at work. The curse impacted all of mankind's dominion, introducing death and decay. Work is now characterized by fruitlessness and futility and failure. Uh, We need somebody to restore our relationship with God. The good news is, we have good news, it's the gospel, that Jesus restored that relationship And as we yield our lives to him, his spirit will shine the light of truth in our lives and impact everybody and all about us, including our work. And so let's look at that. This is the passage from Ephesians 6. This is where Paul is writing to the Ephesian church, and he um, is giving some guidance on uh, uh, between bond slaves and masters, <laughs> we can see, yeah, the work relationship did really well, right, with a curse. Now we, now we don't just have workers, we have bond slaves. And we don't just have bosses, we have masters. And yet, 
the gospel speaks even to this extreme situation. Uh, bond slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord. I say, wait a minute. No, I work for Texas Instruments. I said, no, no. Remember, you work for the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord whether he is a bondservant or, f- or free, knowing that whatever good anyone does, is your work good? You know that job review I always have, like you know, in the middle of the year and at the end of the year? That's not the last job review I get. One of these days, God will give each of us a job review on how well we did our job, our jobs. <laughs> knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or free. So as God shines the light on our lives, what do we need to do? Well, I think the first idea is, um, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't read the second part of the passage. Masters, do the same for them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there's no partiality with him. Again, if you're in the position of being a manager, think about this. We'll, we'll talk about this more in detail. What's the first thing that we need to do? I think it is to ad- identify, confess, and renounce where work has been exalted as an idol in our lives and apply the gospel truth to cast down these idols. Okay? What are some of the idols? The first one I listed here is identity. It's that idea of my work is my name. Um, it's who I am. You know, a lot of times when we talk to people and we say, oh, what's your name? Oh, hi. I'm, and they say, well, what do you do? Right? And, um, and it's, it's almost associated with our name. This is the mistake, I think, that they made back in Babel. This is the mistake that we make today where our identity is wrapped up in our work. And the problem is um, my vocation will likely change over time. Um, but my name will not. Does that make sense? My vocation may change over time, but my work will not. Uh, it's, identity is a painful master when we confuse the two. Um, if you're a homeschool mom, that's a great calling. But Lord willing, your kids will graduate someday. <laughs> if you're in the middle of that, sometimes you think, will that day ever come? It will come. What then? Who are you? If that's your identity. Um, the other, uh, what happens if the technology changes? Um, uh, you know, at, uh, my son Isaac and I were at the Ranger game, and during one of the breaks, you know, they said, the group on this row have won a, a new, um, a, in part of this new movie that's coming out, and they all receive a DVD of this movie. I looked at Isaac going, DVDs. <laughs> <laughs> what if you're the DVD manufacturers? <laughs> How many people still have a DVD player? How about a VHS player? You know, you, know, you think about all my movies on VHS players, stop raising your hands. So <laughs> I know, you know who you are. I know who you are. <laughs> and I do too. <laughs> I have those too. Um, big stack of technolo- old technology in my closet of things that, that were people's, if that was your, your work was your identity, your technology's gone. What if, um, as you see the news, you see the, all this, this word about artificial intelligence? And you realize AI is coming for you. <laughs> what do you do? Uh, we talked about football again. The, the thing that came to my mind was Tom Brady, greatest football player ever. Uh, ten years ago, um, he had a, uh, an interview. And uh, let me see if I can get some of this. He only had three of uh, Super Bowl rings at the time uh, out of five. And they interviewed him, and they said, um, uh, said his, his wife was a, is a gorgeous uh, uh, model. He could buy anything his heart desired, despite phenomenal success, that any young male might consider the pinnacle of life. Tom Brady mused to the interviewer, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? Um, I mean, maybe a lot of people might say, hey, man, this is what uh, it is. I, I reached my goal, my dream, my life. Me, I think... It's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't, this can't be all that it's cracked up to be. 
um, the interview asked the Patriots quarterback at the time, what's the answer? And Brady replied, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. I love playing football and I love being quarterback for this team, but at the same time, um, I think there are a lot of other parts about me that I'm trying to find. Ten years later, um, he changed team. He lost the team. He lost his wife from all the stress of what do you do? Do you retire? He retired. He unretired. He re-retired. This last week, he turned 46 years old. He's getting older. His body is able to do that. If you're the greatest of all time, what at your job, what happens? Identity is in your job, and you have to stop doing your job. It's got to but what does the gospel say? The gospel says, my work is not my name. My work is not my identity. I am a child of God. That never changes. Now, once I belong to the Lord Jesus, that's my identity. How about another idol we have is worth? I'm valuable because of what I do. Many of the same things happen. What happens if what you do changes? Um... Even in ministry, this can be a problem. I'm valuable because I'm a minister. Um, I thought a quote from Pastor Paul Tripp in his book, Dangerous Calling, was interesting. He said, you know, I'm not something because I'm in ministry. Can I say this more powerfully? I am something because I am in Christ. The bottom line. And when I need ministry to be something, I have forsaken the gospel in a way that I am living. How can I forsake the gospel while being a minister of the gospel? It can't work but it happened to me. I had to be the smartest. I had to be the best. I had to be the fill in the blank because ministry was defining me and it's a mess. It can never work. We're not worth something because of what we do. We're worth something. My value doesn't come from my work. Christ's work in sacrifice to redeem me shows me my true value by his love for me and for you. That's our value. That's our worth. How about security? Security is another idol we tend to have. Right? I want my work because I can earn money and I can be secure. Um, this is a, 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 a um, destructive master also because how insecure we actually feel because we all know that we can lose our job. Right? The economy could go bad. We could be injured. Um, technology may change. AI may come. Whatever. We lose our job and we become insecure because we know If that's our security, that's what is going to happen to us. I always think of, we overcompensate a lot of times. Rather than trusting the Lord, we tend to try to say, well, I'll just work extra hard. You know, it's easy to trust the Lord when there's $5,000 in my bank account than when there's $5 in my bank account, right? Why is that? Why is that? I think it's because my trust is in the dollar amount, right? It's in the job. It's in the security. It's where the money's coming from. That's my security. Uh, That's an idol. That's an idol. I think back to... Uh, the pilgrims and Thanksgiving. We know that first winter was so harsh. Uh, many of them died. Most of them died. They were reduced to five kernels of corn per day as a ration. Uh, and as they would later on, uh, in years following, they would often begin a meal with had that bounteous uh, food that the Lord had provided. They would begin with five corn on their plate uh, to remind them of what God had provided and where they'd come. But some people, that was a little much. For their children, the way they said was, that's not going to happen to me. And the way it happened to me is that I'm going to plant large fields of grain and harvest it. And as they began to each grab more and more land, that began to spread them out further and further. And soon their efforts for a large harvest, began to isolate them. They weren't able to travel as far back into town. They weren't able to attend church services. Their pastors at the time appealed to them and said, stop doing this. You're you're focused so much on your work that you're neglecting your worship and your fellowship and your community and your relationships with God. Um, And soon afterward, there was this Indian war. And guess who died first? It was the people on the fringes, the people that had, for their own security, it ended up that their quest for security in their work actually was what ended in their demise, in their their failing. The same thing happens for us. As we try to drive and make work uh, our security, we neglect our relationships. What does the um, um, 
gospel say? All my work and investments in this world are going to pass away. And focusing on these impoverishes my relationships with God and others. Christ promises when I seek him first and invest in his kingdom, he'll take care of my needs. He eternally secures my life. Finally, I threw this one in just for me, and that is perfectionism. (laughs) How many are perfectionists? Okay, okay, good. It's okay, you can raise your hand for that. Um, I, um, I have to have it done right. You know, you think, is the, the, you know, is it perfect? And I can never finish the work just because it has to be perfect. Why is that? Because I think it reflects about me. I don't want people saying, Tim does sloppy work. But there's a bit of too much <laughs> sometimes. I have to think, you know, quality work involves meeting a schedule many times, Right? And many times, perfection, you know, high quality is desired. For what I do sometimes, if you make a small mistake, it can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. So high quality is desired. At the same time, there are schedules, and you have to balance that uh, amount of effort and perfectionism to meet the goal. What does the gospel say? Um, it's, uh, the reason, again, I do this is because I think it reflects on me. And I have to realize, you know, I'm incapable of perfection through my own efforts. That's what the gospel says. All of us have sinned and fall short of God's standards. Yet I'm perfect in God's sight as I receive his gift of a perfect declaration of righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's the only way and the only sense I can be perfect. So one thing I believe the Spirit will do as he redeems our work is to help us identify the idols. The second thing, I think from our passage, it leads us to mind our motives. And that is, do we work for self? Are we selfish in our motives? Um, it lists, I'll just list a couple of questions here that, that I think I, I, looking through that passage appealed to me. One would be, do I work with a higher intensity or quality if others are watching, right? Am I a, um, um, a people pleaser? I believe is the way Paul said it. Uh, we have other words uh, for that, we have um, uh, apple polishers, um, you know, boot lickers. You can go on. Some are even worse than others. We all know what they are referring to, people that just do things so the boss can see them. And as soon as the boss leaves, they stop doing the work. It's because you think, oh, they're working to please the boss. No, they're working to please themselves. Um, and when we realize that um, if we do that, that's really working for ourselves. Another th- way that I think about um, working for self, how do I treat other people? Do I treat them as God's um, image bearers? Or do I, like this master that we talked about in the passage, do we treat them as work units um, just to fulfill our own agenda? Um, whenever they ask, the one that convicts me was when people ask for help, do I think of them as interruptions, right? What does that say if I see somebody as an interruption? It means I'm the priority. They're stopping my priority. It's not helping them that's important. It's it's interrupting my agenda. And that just reveals I'm working for me. I'm not working for God. I'm working for me. Um, Does my work reflect an attitude that this life is all there is? This can take two extremes. One could be overwork because I think this work is so important. I neglect all my relationships, maybe my health, um, because I think all my reward is in this life. What if I forget the other uh, extreme here? Remember that we said that, that whatever the Lord um, will reward each one according to his work? Um, do I th- get upset? Do I get bitter at my boss? Thinking that my reward from my work is only going to be what they pay me. Do I look forward to eternity and say, no, God's going to honor, it's going to bless what I did. Even maybe if I suffered some hardship, during my work uh, here on earth, is he going to bless me in eternity um, and reward me in eternity because I did my work as unto him and not as unto just T.I.? Um, and then finally, uh, how do I know if I'm working for myself? One idea might be how much of my income and leisure time beyond my basic needs is spent for me, Right? It's the idea, we, we forget this idea, you know, of loving our neighbor as ourself. One way to do that is to do our work with excellence. Remember that idea? It's the idea that 
I'm who I am because of all my hard work, all my studies. I, all of my teachers, they didn't have any part of it. All my parents, all that they did for me, they didn't have any part of it. It was just me, and it's my hard work that earns it. And so when I earn something, it it's, goes to me. It, I, I'm the one that deserves it. Rather than seeing it says, no, God's given me resources more than what I need so that I can bless others, so I can be a blessing, so I can build his kingdom, so I can minister in his name, so I can help those that are ministering in his name to have a greater influence. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I think Alan was, was preaching on the, the rich fool. And I think, have I become a rich fool? Notice what quote from this guy. S- see if this sounds familiar. He said, I will say to myself, self, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, you've got, I've got so much more than I need, and you know the response to that is? Spend it on me. Stop working. That's my goal. That's a rich fool. Scripture points that out as that's just ha- that person has a short-sighted view of what God is doing. So how should we then? Um, we said we want to identify the idols, mind our motives, and finally, we want to recall our calling. Remember who we work for. Remember that we work for God. And I have uh, six things here briefly. Uh, let's go through. The first one is I think it's important for us to identify with the Lord Jesus. If I work for the Lord, I want to make everybody that I work w- with know that I belong to the Lord Jesus. And then watch for his work among our coworkers. Um, um, that doesn't mean that I um, spend all my time at work sharing the gospel. Um, they, you know, TI hires me to build computer chips. I do that. I want to do that with excellence. But there are many opportunities that come up to identify with Christ. The best compliment I've ever received at work was during a group meeting when someone says, Tim is so helpful to us all the time. And somebody said, oh, that's because he's a Christian. And the, and the, the board that was leading the group said, you know, Jesus was one that helped someone. And I'm just, my jaw just drops, right? I'm thinking, wow. Um, it's the greatest compliment I've ever had at work. But it comes because I identified with the Lord Jesus. When there was an opportunity, I would share what he's done in my life and what he can do in theirs. Um, and I watch for his work. Thank the Lord for his provision and seek to be a good steward. Don't realize that God, through the blessing of cultural mandate, you know, we're not spending our spare time sewing our next, uh, our clothes, um, you know, or um, uh, building our next vehicle or, or doing all the other things that we are raising the food for tomorrow that, that we need. We're depending on the, the culture, uh, the blessing of human culture to do that work. Because we live in that type of a culture, we have extra spare time, and we have extra spare income. Give that to us to spend just on ourselves. He does it so that we can be others. So thank the Lord for his provision. Seek to be a good steward. Many times we encounter stress at work. Because you work for the Lord, take the stress to your boss. (laughs) Take the stress to the Lord. Say, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Address the stress of work with prayer and trust his sovereignty. Do your work with excellence. Yet ask the Lord's blessing and direction. There's many times at work, it, you know, it used to be a lot more stressed like, oh, we're not going to meet this goal. Oh, we're not going to be able to make that chip. Oh, and I think, what am I doing here? I'm just churning in, in uh, worry. And I say, Lord, okay, I want to lift this up to you. Lord, help us to make this um, with excellence. Lord, help us to meet this schedule. Lord, help me to have, know the priorities I need to do today. Uh, take it to the Lord. Um, rather than just stress over it. Fourth, make an appeal when work conditions cross boundaries. There's been times I've needed to appeal to the Lord and, or to appeal to my boss and say, hey, this is too much work. Or let me make an appeal. Tell you what, I can't work this Saturday, but let me work longer hours during the week. You know, let's, let's do this. And so to make an appeal uh, where there's cross boundaries. Do you think the Lord cares? Yeah, the Lord listened 400 years to his people in Egypt. And it's not people were, in Egypt were thinking, God didn't hear me. God didn't hear me. God heard. It just was not his timing yet and his sovereignty. In James 5, God warns the rich. He said, hey, um, you know, the cry of your laborers has come to my ears. It's reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. God listens to his people when they cry out. 
So make an appeal and cry out to the Lord. Uh, and then finally, or I'm sorry, recognize that uh, temporal work for the Lord has an eternal reward. We've mentioned this before. Um, in Psalm 90, uh, verse 7, Moses said, Lord, establish the work of our hands. In Ecclesiastes, you always think, well, everything that I do here in this life is going to be, um, um, is gonna come to an end, it's going to be futile. Right? I might be the DVD manufacturer right? that's going to go out of business. Lord, my, all my DVDs that I've made, is that really going to last? And the Lord says, because you did it to me. You know, if you give a cup of cold water to someone in the name of the Lord, he says, you will not lose your reward. If you do your work as unto the Lord, even if what you do on this earth passes away, there will be an eternal reward. How do you lay up treasures in heaven? Right? Uh, Randy Alcorn points out, he says, you know, you can't lay up, uh, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. This is the same kind of idea. When we do our work under the Lord, it, makes, it turns temporary uh, uh, things into having eternal value. And then finally, take a Sabbath day each week to rest and reflect on the Lord and your relationship with him. Evaluate how your work is being redeemed um, and fulfill his mandate uh, and it, how it's fulfilling his mandate to bless others. How are you doing? It's good to st- take a, a day a week to just stop and evaluate. Lord, how's my, am I giving you, seeking you first in, my, in your kingdom? Am I seeking your kingdom first? Am I giving you the priority that you need? Lord, am I giving the proper relationship, uh, uh, attention to my other relationships with my wife, my children, my family, uh, with others? Um, is my work blessing um, others as you've called me to do? So take a Sabbath day each week. A lot of times without, when we don't take a time of rest, we just become so focused on work that everything else pales. That's one of the purposes of a Sabbath is to stop and evaluate. Stop and worship the Lord, evaluate what he's done. How can we apply this? Well, um, I have many applications in the, in the notes this week. All of the things that you've seen today are in the notes. One question I'd leave with you is, how can you develop a habit of beginning the day acknowledging the Lord as your boss and trusting his sovereignty, dedicating all your work to him? That's what I try to do each each, uh, day at the beginning. I'm to develop that habit each day in the morning. Lord, I'm going to try to work for you today. Help me to honor you in that. Finally, um, I wanted to leave with a a couple of incidents from Amy Carmichael's life. She was a missionary to India in the early 1900s. One of the things that she's known for was helping Uh, for them to pass laws that stopped the uh, sex trafficking and temple prostitution at the time. Uh, She rescued over a thousand young uh, children from um, this this, um, uh, sex trafficking and temple prostitution, brought them up in the ways of the Lord. But not everybody valued that work. In India, many of the missionary community uh, shunned her ministry to orphans. Some believe that those temple children, quote-unquote, didn't exist, Others looked down on the acts of service and emphasis at Donover Fellowship, where she worked, to the education, physical care, and character building of each child. During one cholera outbreak, she gathered her things to go minister to the, to the city there in a bucket, put some uh, disinfectants, bottles, rags, medicines in a, in a couple of buckets, and there was a visiting missionary there. Ask him, can you help me carry one of these buckets? And he goes, no thanks, I think I'd rather carry my Bible. She thought that was kind of odd. But contrast that with the account of a new believer um, in uh, Elizabeth Elliot's biography of Amy Carmichael called A Chance to Die. She gave the account of where there were some new believers that had come from a high caste uh, set, and they were working to dig um, the foundation of one of the new uh, ministry houses. But they were doing it alongside those that were in the low caste um, uh, workmen. And she said no sterner test could have been applied to prove the validity of their faith. Amy had seen enough of those who followed Christianity for its prestige. She later wrote, you know, it would take grace and teaspoons would have sufficed for a preaching tour. It's honorable to preach. But ditch digging lends dignity to nobody. It took grace and rivers for these men to do this. And she said, and yet I saw them grow in Christ's likeness every day because of their dedication to do that. To, and it, how did they do that? I think they because they realized who they worked for. It wasn't the work. It wasn't 
really, it doesn't really matter if you have a bucket or a Bible or a teaspoon or a shovel in your hand. It's who gave it to you and who are you working for with it. Sometimes the Lord will give us each of those. There may be different circumstances that you'll have each of those. And what we need to do is to learn to respond to the one who calls us to do the work and to serve him faithfully and with joy. And that way, we'll be zealous for good work and give honor to our Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the gift of work that you give us. Lord, help us to use it for your glory. Forgive us, Lord, where we've um, sinned and where we've exalted idols. Uh, Help us to honor you through our work and all that we do. And help us to be zealous for doing good work, to bring you glory, to do everything that we do, to do it for the name of Christ. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.